My name is Madison Lightfoot and I'm with Senator Shaheen's New Hampshire team. Um, we're just waiting for everyone to get added. It looks like folks are joining us now. Um, and as we get started here, I will go through a quick roll call of the folks that we have on the line, just so everyone's aware. And I'll also go through a role of press who's joining us. And then I'll hand it over to Senator Shaheen for some opening remarks. Um, joining us from the New Hampshire um, Family Planning Programs, we have Kayla Montgomery from Planned Parenthood New Hampshire Action Fund, Ken Gordon from Coas County Family Health Services, Dr. Brianne Tebel, also from Coas County Family Health Services, Greg White from Lamprey Healthcare, Dahlia Venunes from Equality Health Center, Susan Winuk from the Belknap Merrimack Community Action Partnership Agency. Um, we will be joined by Chris McCracken um, from Amoskeg Health. She'll be joining us a bit later. We have Tess um, Stack Kooning from Bi State Primary Care Association. And also joining us from Bi State is Christine Stoddard. Um, and not last but not least, we have Martha Siri from the Concord Hospital Family Planning Center. Those are the participants for this morning and joining us from our press corps, we also have the union leader, NHPR, WMUR, the Caledonian Record, the Berlin Daily Sun, the Concord Monitor, New Hampshire Bulletin, and the AP. And with that, I will hand it over to Senator Shaheen. Well, thanks very much, Madison. And thank you all so much for joining me this morning. I I just want to point out that from my staff, in addition to Madison, we have Peter Fies, who works on healthcare issues in DC. We also have Sarah Weinstein and Alan Rodriguez, who are working with the communications team, and Sarah Holmes, who's my state director, is with me here in Dover. So again, thank you all so much. Um, we're really here to talk about the unprecedented legislation in the budget that will limit women's access to reproductive health. It comes after the effort of the former administration in Washington to cut off um, Title X funds, which has had a real impact on each of you um, as healthcare providers. And I'm interested this morning in hearing how you think this new legislation is gonna impact you and your ability to provide the care that women in New Hampshire needs need. I, I would just say this is, from my history in this state, unprecedented that in the live free or die state, we would see an extreme legislative position to try and control women's bodies to get between women and their health care provider. Um, and it's not just on the abortion issue, it's also about access to family planning services. If you don't like abortion, you should support family planning. Um, one of the things that we saw at the end of the Obama administration because of access to health care was that teen pregnancy was at its lowest rate in history. So we know that these programs are important to women and families so that they can um, address their own family needs. We know that the work that you do also provides critical health screenings for mammograms, for cancer screenings, for sexually transmitted diseases, which have been on the rise. And what this legislation does is significantly limit access for thousands of women in New Hampshire to the health care they need um, for themselves and their families. One of the things that I did um, this week is sent a letter this actually this morning to Health and Human Service, or Services Secretary Becerra to raise the concerns about what the impact of this legislation will be on women and to see if he can help us come up with some funding that will get um, many of your agencies through the period when they're really going to be totally cut off and having difficulty with the financial circumstances of what the legislature has done. I just would also say that in addition to coming between women and their doctors, this is an effort to make it difficult for you all to operate the audit provisions. And I'm interested in hearing how you think this is going to affect you, but the audit provisions that have been included in the legislation um, are designed to um, really make it difficult for you all to operate. Um, it's disappointing, not just the legislation in and of itself, but to put it in the budget um, where people were not aware that it was going in. Um, it's disappointing that Governor Sununu has not been willing to stand up to the legislature and take a position on this. 
Um, so I, I think what we, what I'm interested in hearing this morning is how you think you will be affected and what we might be able to do in Washington to help in your circumstances to help ensure that women in New Hampshire have access to the health care they need. So let me stop with that and ask Madison to go ahead and um, call on folks so that I can hear from you all. Thank you, Senator. And just a friendly reminder, if folks could um, keep themselves on mute when you're not speaking, that will help with the background noise. Um, and if folks can keep their remarks to uh, three to four minutes, that'll be helpful as we conclude around 1030. And with that, I will hand it over to Kayla Montgomery from Planned Parenthood New Hampshire Action Fund. Great. Uh, thank you all. Good morning. My name is Kayla Montgomery. Uh, I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood New Hampshire Action Fund and Planned Parenthood Northern New England. Um, thank you very much for having me today. Planned Parenthood Northern New England is a uh, three-state 501c3 healthcare provider. We have 21 health centers in Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, five here in New Hampshire, Keene, Claremont, Manchester, Derry, and Exeter. We are extremely proud to be a part of the New Hampshire Family Planning Network. We're the biggest provider of specialized uh, reproductive and sexual health here in New Hampshire. And of course, we work in partnership with the rest of the New Hampshire Family Planning Network in order to ensure that lower income granite staters get the preventative health care they need talking about birth control, STI testing and treatment, cancer screenings. This network is so critical, but as we all know, it's fragile, and which is why the state budget is such a disaster for all of us. The program is drastically underfunded. It doesn't take into account the lack of federal funding that the previous administration took away. The current administration uh, and our entire federal delegation are working as fast as they can to restore, and we're incredibly grateful for that. But we do understand these things take time which is why we did everything we could to mitigate the harm of this budget by attempting to add additional funds to the program. But every step of the way, they were rejected. And we know that the New Hampshire family planning program has nothing to do with abortion care. We know that state and federal funds never go to abortion care. Patients must self-pay or use private insurance. And yet, some anti-reproductive health lawmakers are so intent on stopping abortion that they're willing to take down the entire network that thousands of granite staters rely on. And this is unconscionable. The state budget does more than just does more than just underfund the family planning program. It also creates significant barriers to care early in pregnancy and bans care later in pregnancy. It criminalizes doctors, it adds costly and medically unnecessary procedures, it's cruel and it's dangerous. And like Senator Shaheen just said, it's the most anti-reproductive health, health budget our state has ever seen. But we really appreciate Senator Shaheen and our entire delegation for fighting back, doing all they can to mitigate the harm. And I also want to thank the Senator for her work on permanently repealing uh, the global gag rule with the HER Act. It's so clear that the global gag rule has to be gone once and for all. Thank you. Thank you, Kayla, very much. Um, Madison, do we have someone else who's next? Yep, thank you, Kayla. Next, we'll go to Martha Siri from Con Concord Hospital Family Health Center. Hi, Martha. Oh, Martha, it looks like you're muted. There you go. There we go. So I'm the um, director of the Family Health Center, both here in Concord and in Hillsboro. Uh, we also have a family medicine residency, and much like um, the family planning unit, we are the safety net for our county. We have an oral health, we have a dental clinic here that is supported by the state. We're the refugee resettlement center for our area. Um, we have primary care funding through uh, Department of Health and Human Services, but really where we were one of the seven that um, withdrew our Title X back in 19 um, because we have 24 family medicine residents and per our accreditation body, we are required to teach options counseling to them. So what we did was we, we declined moving forward with that and we continue to teach options counseling because it is a requirement of all trainees in our program. Um, so we have taken that position and will continue to do that um, regardless of what happens because our residents are young. Um, they're leaving our or our 
uh, organization and going out to the state, to other states. And um, we will continue to do this regardless of funding sources. But much like everyone else, it, it, it's imperative. I mean, the hospital supports the residency, the health center, and any funding that we can get to help support the education of residents and our safety net organization would be hugely helpful. So anything that can be done um, in Washington, in, in New Hampshire, um, you know, it's a, this is a passion for young doctors. And this is why they go into family medicine. Um, they want to care for all patients, regardless of their ability to pay. And they want to care for patients based on what the patient wants and needs and not what the government wants the patients to have. So it's an important patient continuity and a patient right and ask. Thanks, Martha. Can you tell me if you had, if you had continued to do what, um, what the, in 2019, when the uh, Title X program was halted, would you have lost your certification? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we, it never even was an option that we would not teach residents full spectrum um, and options counseling. We never even gave it a thought that we would not teach options, options counseling. So it didn't come up because you it wasn't even an option for you? Nope, because it is in our um, guidelines, we have requirements and it is one of the requirements. So we did not even consider it. Thank you. And will you, as you're thinking about the um, services you provide, I should have asked you this too, Kayla. Um, do you have any sense about what, how you will be limited in providing those services because of this action and because of what's happened with Title X? which hopefully will get reversed, but it's not gonna get reversed probably for till the end of the year. We, we will work with our philanthropy, philanthropy department to seek other um, funding sources. And um, the organization is very, Concord Hospital is very supportive of our clinic um, and we'll continue to have conversations with them. We are a department see. of the hospital, so yeah. Thank you. Yes, um, same for us. We um, certainly don't think that healthcare should be dependent on philanthropy, but we will do everything we can to mitigate the harm here and prepare for it. Um, but we know we've been through this before um, and we might see things like longer patient wait time. One thing we really like to be able to do is provide same day um, appointments for people, particularly when it comes to um, birth control, emergency contraception, whatever we can do. And unfortunately we might, we may see some longer wait times. Um, one thing that uh, we know we're going to have to change our protocol and our procedures around is on this mandatory ultrasound provision. That is a significant change in the way we do care. Um, and um, there's a lot of sort of internal processes we have to work out um, because there's a lot of unanswered questions still with the budget, particularly around that mandated ultrasound piece. Right, and there's a cost involved too your patients for that as well, right? Absolutely. A cost that is for something that's often medically unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you, Martha, and thank you, Kayla. Next, we'll go to Ken Gordon, the CEO of Coas County Family Health Services. Hi, Ken. Mm -hmm. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Senator. Um, thank you for your support of community health centers over the many years. Thanks for your work on the infrastructure bill that's uh, forthcoming. And thanks for your letter to Secretary Becerra of, uh, earlier today, uh, all uh, much appreciated. While we respect the work uh, of those that have supported the changes to the, um, they're incorporated in the state budget, we really disagree strongly, as strongly as we can with um, these rules. Um, and we do so for the following reasons. Uh, first off, we continue to believe, as you stated, that um, government and politicians have no place in the conversation between a provider and a patient, uh, whether it's reproductive health care matters, cancer, 
um, hypertension, whatever it may be. This is just not a role for government. And we continue to see uh, government intruding in this really sacred relationship. We have an obligation to our patients uh, to preserve uh, that relationship and to make sure that um, they receive all information available them, to them about the options that are available and uh, will not allow um, anyone to intrude uh, on that obligation. Uh, secondly, like many of the folks that have promoted these changes, we too are deeply invested in helping women to prevent uh, unplanned pregnancies. And we're some of the folks who are doing arguably some of the most important work in that regard. Unfortunately, as you pointed out, the unintended effect of these rule changes are that there will be more uh, unplanned pregnancies, that access to care will be more difficult for many people. And so uh, we oppose those rules on that basis. Uh, thirdly, uh, reproductive health services are the gateway really to many other important health services, health screenings, uh, STD uh, screenings, uh, hypertension, breast cancer, cervical cancer, and so on. And so to limit access to reproductive health services means limiting access to those other services as well. And lastly, uh, as an organization, we view this potentially as a form of discrimination. Uh, we're singling out a class of, of people. Uh, these are low-income women, uh, and um, we cannot do that. Um, and in fact, there are constitutional protections. Uh, to uh, make sure that that kind of thing doesn't happen. And we hope that the federal government will look at whether the state's actions in uh, this regard uh, reflect um, discrimination on the basis of class. And then lastly, and I'll speak personally, I, I think we have to step back from uh, this whole issue of reproductive rights and look at um, how this new chapter uh, here in New Hampshire uh, fits into the larger uh, historical um, effort to uh, about women's rights. And uh, over time, uh, we all know that not that long ago in this country, uh, women uh, were treated as property. Uh, they did not have the right to vote. Uh, they could not uh, pursue professions and they certainly could not sue in, in governmental roles. And there has been a longstanding effort to continue to prevent women fulfilling their full potential. And this is part of that. And we need to resist that, whether it happens in this country or it happens in any other country, and work to make sure that women have the rights, the full rights of citizenship in this country and the full right to pursue uh, their lives in full. So I'll stop there. Thanks very much, Ken. And thank you for, for that historical context, which I think is really important. Can you imagine if the legislature were requiring a procedure that might be unnecessary for men with their doctors, what the uproar would be, it wouldn't have happened. So as you point out, Ken, this is part of what has been a centuries old struggle to ensure that women have access to the same kinds of rights and opportunities that men do in this country. And one of the most basic of that is the ability to control our own bodies and to make determinations about very personal and private decisions on our own um, without having the government tell us what to do. So I appreciate your putting this into that historical context. Thank you, Ken. And Dr. Tebold, um, I'm going to go to you, after Ken, from Coas County Family Health as well. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me on this call. Uh, it means a lot. I thought I'd give more of a, sort of a, an on-the-ground perspective, since this is my day in, day out. Um, and just to give you a little background, I actually, I didn't even start med school till I was 30 and spent a lot of the majority of my 20s um, being very active um, as an advocate for reproductive rights. I volunteered with Planned Parenthood in Connecticut, uh, NARAL in Connecticut, and actually went into to medicine because of my my feelings of, of wanting to advocate for, for women and their reproductive rights. So this whole thing hits really close to home. Um, I did all of my medical training in Baltimore and Philadelphia, um, and then decided to move to Berlin, New Hampshire three years ago, um, which is in so many ways uh, the opposite of, of where I did my training. 
Um, but in so many ways, absolutely no different. Um, we deal with a huge underserved population here up in Berlin and the surrounding areas. Um, many people have moved into the area in recent years because it's the cheapest place to live in New Hampshire. Um, so we, we deal with a lot of younger folks um, who are on um, disability, who are on um, Medicaid, the majority are, um, a lot of people from, from traumatic backgrounds, young people um, in particular who are just suffering from many different mental health disorders. Um, and uh, half of them have reproductive organs. And as you can imagine, um, they've had interface with medical community that has stigmatized them. And the second they come into our dorm, we, we are defined as the, the catch-all for everyone for healthcare up here, but, but we, we are also the Planned Parenthood of the North Country. We, we are the, the Women's Healthcare Center of the North Country. So we do everything, and that's initially what drew me here. And then um, having Ken here to really advocate for the, the family planning aspect of, of our clinics has been huge. I'm able to offer same day services. I talk to all the providers. I say, if there's anyone who comes into the door at any time and they want an explanon, the subdermal implant, if they want an IUD, I'll fit them in, into my schedule that day. No problem, we'll make room um, because it's just that important. I also deliver babies. So I work at the critical access hospital here. There's only one OBGYN within a 30 mile radius. Um, but I was trained in my family medicine residency, like Martha was, was saying, I was um, really grateful. I, I did abortion care in my residency. We provided abortions down, down the hall in the same place we were seeing newborn infants and, and treating the, the older adults. So um, family medicine really is a, a continuum of care and it involves reproductive rights on a daily, daily, hour to hour basis. Um, and having the, the lack of funding and support to be able to do that would be devastating. And I, I can certainly speak to, you know, we'll see number of, of uh, pregnancies increase. And we, we frankly don't have the room. We, we already, there's kind of been a COVID boom up here. We're looking at, at 50 plus pregnancies or deliveries coming up before the end of the year, just at our 25 bed hospital. That's 25 beds for everyone, not just, you know, we have two to three labor and delivery beds at any one time. But um, one can only imagine the, the catastrophe that we might run into if, if we see the, the trickle down effect of lack of funding. And um, Dartmouth isn't gonna wanna take a three hour transfer and um, even the other nearby hospitals. We're already seeing funding cut for hospitals and, and the women's services in the hospitals. So, um, and our, our, our labor and delivery and matern maternal health care is already suffering. So that, that would just be the trickle down doomsday. Well, thank you. Thank you for um, providing that day-to-day -day description <laughs> of what's gonna happen for women. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tebold. Next, we'll go to Greg White at Lamprey Healthcare. Uh, good morning, Senator. Good morning, everyone good morning. else. Uh, uh, I'm Greg White, uh, CEO of Lamprey Healthcare. We have sites in Nashua, Newmarket, and Raymond, uh, as well as a number of integrated sites across the southeastern part of the state and a new mobile health unit. So um, I guess I would echo the comments of all of my colleagues today. Um, we're very frustrated that uh, we have, in effect, legislated a structural disparity in access to care, um, interrupting cancer screenings, STI testing, and consequently treatment. Uh, family planning and contraception are all huge impacts on us. And, and like Ken said, uh, a, a little troubled or quite troubled that we've in effect interrupted access for folks at the lower end of the economic scale. And I would actually point out that for Lamprey, this lands disproportionately on people of color. Uh, we have a very diverse operation in Nashua. And, and in a time when we've worked so hard at health equity, and access to care, it, it just, it, it astounds me that this, this backward step uh, would land in our lap. Uh, as a business, uh, we employ the people in our community. So this has a double whammy. Uh, it, 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 it impacts us as a small provider that's just emerged from the pandemic um, and the struggles that went with that. Um, workforce is, is a huge issue for all healthcare providers today very competitive environment, 
not enough folks coming into the healthcare arena. It's hard to retain them. Having some sort of funding doubt or shortfall in funding does not help that situation for us. Um, we'll be in a position where we'll have to, I think we'll have to shoulder the loss of the interrupted funding and take services or funding away from other services and shift it just to keep that service going. Um, very troubling. And I guess I'm, I'm at a loss as to, you know, how do we get around this? So, Greg, can you talk about, or maybe somebody else wants to add to this, about what, what you think the audit provisions that are um, included might mean? I mean, it seems to me nothing more than an effort to harass um, family planning efforts. For sure. I, my sense is at, at Lamprey, I think we would we would comply in terms of you know what an audit would find. We wouldn't be in any sort of hot water, as it were. Um, but sure. you know, we've been doing this program for decades. Um, there's no funding that comes with this audit requirement. Do we have to shoulder the one the cost of that audit? But two, how disruptive of our operation is that going to be? And like I said, in in a time of a emerging from a pandemic, do we need to tie our staff up with people pouring through records looking for something that isn't there? Yeah, thank you. That's that's the perception that I have as well. Thank you, Greg. And next we have Dal Dahlia Vadunas from Equality Health Center. Hi, Dahlia. I think you're still- Thank you, okay. uh, Senator Shaheen for can you hear me now? We can, yeah. Thank you, Senator Shafiqin, for all that you do for uh, the residents of New Hampshire and for all the colleagues that are here. Um, I don't want to repeat all the things that everybody has said because we would be here forever if I did. So I do want to hit on some of the special things that um, will affect the Quality Health Center. We opened our doors in 1974 uh, as a family planning program, providing abortions, providing reproductive health care in all different ways. We're locally owned and locally grown. And one of our key pieces has always been education as well as providing affordable services. With this new budget that is going to really make a tremendous impact on what we can and can't do. Uh, it will totally change our sliding scale fee the way we have it set up now in that approximately one third of our patients are self-pay because our sliding fee scale starts at 250% of poverty level so that it could include people who are working full time at places like Walmart and all that, but don't get health insurance or that have that $10,000 deductible type of health insurance. Uh, we will have to change that because we will no longer afford to be, be able to afford to do that. Um, in addition, as been mentioned before, uh, there'll be longer patient wait time. We try very hard to see patients immediately as soon as they call in. Uh, however, that's not always the case. It does not always work, but now we can guarantee that that won't happen. That will mean more patients will be going to urgent care into emergency rooms because we will not be able to see them in a timely fashion. The same goes for all the other providers here. When we can't see a patient immediately, they go to urgent care, they go to um, different places, they go to emergency rooms. Um, other things that will happen here is, is that um, Equality Health Center has very proudly been a provider of training for residents for both Dartmouth-Hitchcock, for Concord Hospital, for Tufts University on family planning services. Um, we do not get paid for that per se. Um, and we do that because again, part of our mission is to educate and that includes educating providers on how to provide family planning services in a client-centered fashion. This is a program that we may have to stop doing because we will no longer afford, can afford to have the residents come in because it takes up so much of our time. And without the lack of reimbursement, we will not be able to do that. And Dahlia, just um, to interrupt a minute, um, really, what, happens, what happens to those um, residents who are coming to you as, um, as interns to learn 
if you're not providing um, that opportunity, where do they go? Do you know? I can speak to that. I, I don't know. We have more requests than we have availability. We get over a hundred requests a year and we uh, work it out between Dartmouth and Concord, our, our first two responsibilities, work it out between them. But we have residents every single week here as it is. Um, and we, because of COVID, there's been a huge shortage of places to go. We have continued to see people and residents um, and I don't know where they will go. Um, the other issue that um, is really um, in regards to the current budget is the mandatory ultrasound training. Up until COVID, Equality Health Center, we always did ultrasounds on every single patient coming in um, th that basically was going for either continuing our pregnancy or for termination of a pregnancy. COVID taught us we didn't have to do that. And we were actually providing an invasive service that was unnecessary. COVID taught us that, we, that it is actually better for the patient's care not to do those unnecessary ultrasounds. And so we had redone all of our policies based on removing that unnecessary procedure. And now the state legislator is telling us we have to put it back in when after a year and a half later, we can say, no, this is not necessary and not needed. And no one asked us or no one asked any of the providers here whether or not this was good Client, client care or not, and it's not good client care. Can I um, can I ask you for those private so pay I, customers I I, again? How how much does the ultrasound mm -hmm. cost for those private pay customers, and how much will that be um, an issue for people who may have trouble affording care? Since we do have a sliding fee scale, it does go at different levels. I, for our least amount, I believe it's $120, um, which is extraordinarily cheap. But basically we're just, that's all we've been able to charge and it will have to go up drastically. Thank you. Martha, you were gonna add to what happens mm -hmm. to those interns and residents if they can't go to um, Quality Health Center or other places? Where, where are they gonna get that training? I actually called um, Department of Health and Human Services, um, the planning, family planning uh, division to ask where else, and there was somewhere in Greenland, New Hampshire. So that will be the John Lovering Health Center. Yeah, the Lovering Health Center. A little further than is ideal. Yes, thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Dahlia. Um, next, we'll go to Chris McCracken from, um, from Amos Good Health. Hi, Chris. Hi, thank you all and appreciate the opportunity to speak with uh, you, Senator, and the rest of the team that's here who are doing such great work. Um, certainly, we have the same kinds of concerns that others have been speaking about in terms of accessibility for the individuals that take advantage of accessing family planning services at most of the um, programs that you've been speaking to. For us, um, the majority of our patients that access these services access through our adolescent teen clinic, um, or um, many of them postpartum take advantage of the opportunity to um, have planned long-term, long-acting uh, devices, for example, maybe an IUD, or maybe they'll start Depo-Provera um, as a part of their family planning for going on after pregnancy. Um, this funding for us allows us to fund a few positions that work closely with those individuals to coordinate their care, nurses, and other staff members that facilitate services. And so certainly, like your other speakers, the concerns remain about how, what will this do to impact all of the individuals that are coming to access services that many people would get from their primary care provider. And if you're uninsured and you have a limited income and you're trying to do the right thing and take care of your health and take care of your planning for what you want to do in your future with your body, 
it makes it really difficult to do when these resources are so constrained. And when organizations like ours have to make that decision uh, ethically about whether or not we're able to continue to participate when we can't simply provide education and options to individuals who are presenting for care. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Um, next, we're going to go to uh, Tess Keenan at the at Bi State Primary Care Association. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Senator. Really appreciate thanks, the yes, forum. Yes. And thanks for everything you do. The CARES Act, the Consolidated Act, the Rescue Act, the work on the infrastructure bill. You're always there as a voice for the country, voice for New Hampshire, and voice for those who most need it. And you can see by the people that are here um, in this forum really care about those who most need care. And you so eloquently opened up with the impact and really what the issue is. And so our role at Bi State is to work with the health centers. We represent 14 health centers, um, serving 120,000 patients across the um, state. And they all were um, and will want to provide women's reproductive health services. And so this is a, a clear assault on reproductive services, reproductive family planning, and any assault on those is an assault and limitation to access to barriers, access to care. And that's what we do. That's what all of these providers here do. They increase access to healthcare. People who are low and moderate income already have enough issues with regard to access to care. They have financial limitations, they have geographic, they have language barriers. Um, COVID has represented you know, another barrier to care. And to think that we now have um, the Title X program, which is actually built to, as a federal program for these services, right? It is actually a federal program in the 1970s as a grant program for low in, um, income patients to receive family planning and reproductive health for breast exams, for cervical and cancer screenings, for education, for prevention. Um, and so the, um, the thought that the legislature would take away these rights, I think is really reprehensible. And I'm glad there's a lot of voices speaking out um, uh, against that. I'd also thank you and thank you for the letter to um, Becerra. Interested to see that because um, with my work federally, I would really like to work with Madison and with Peter and with you about what we can do to help restore these um, benefits back to these really important providers. So thank you so much, really appreciate you. Well, thanks Tess, I, I appreciate those kind remarks. And Peter, I know that as we know, the Biden administration is planning to restore the Title X program, but that's gonna take some time. And Peter, I don't know, maybe you wanna give people a little update on um, what we've learned about the time that's gonna take and what's involved. Sure, um, thanks Senator. I think, you know, Earlier in April, the Biden administration proposed to reverse the Title X gag rule. Now it's a proposed rule that still has to go through the formal rulemaking process. You know, we think the earliest they could probably do this is late summer to finalize the rule, but that's not unfortunately where it ends. Um, the administration would then have to go through a formal RFP process to you know, request proposals for all of the centers who exited the Title X program to return. Um, and that process is a months long process that um, we think you know, could be wrapped up at the very earliest in December. And that creates you know, several months worth of uh, a funding gap due to the restrictions that have been put in place um, in the New Hampshire budget bill. So you lose that state funding that was supposed to backfill you um, and you don't have the, the Title X funding restored until late this year, early next year. And so, what we had in our, our letter and what Senator Sheen sent to Secretary Becerra was to say, you know, in this interim period, can you work with us to help us find alternative sources of funding to help bridge that gap? You know, whether that is um, providing a supplemental award as soon as the Title X gag rule reversal is finalized before you go through that RFP process, or maybe you tap into other funds that are available at HHS to to help um, provide some, some sources of uh, financing for that you know, six to nine month period. Um, so that's, that's something that Senator Sheen sent this morning to the secretary and, uh, and we'll be working on. Thank you Thanks, for thanks. that. 
Oh, I was, I just, thank you so much because we were speaking with a number of the health centers and that bridge, that ability to bridge those, that funds, because when you take funds away from this program, it also takes funds away from your dental program, from your medical services. So, you know, you're essentially just moving money around. And what happens is you, it's not just reproductive health services that, that are lost here. It's all services that are lost. So thank you very much for that. Well, hopefully the secretary will be willing to work with us and we can find some creative ways to address the situation that you're all going to be in. Because as you've all pointed out, um, taking funding away from this doesn't just affect, first of all, it doesn't just affect abortion. It affects because those aren't covered by federal funds anyway, but it affects the other services that you provide. And as a number of you have noted, um, those people who are least able to uh, to fund those services on their own, uh, young people, people who are economically disadvantaged, people who live in rural parts of the state who don't have transportation, all of those things have an impact. And so this is a, what the legislature has done is to inflict harm on so many people in the state because of these onerous provisions. Um, so Madison, I, I don't know, I think we've heard from everybody but Christine. Yep, and Susan from the Belknap Merrimack CAP unfortunately lost power um, mid conversation oh, no. and hasn't been able to join us. Um, so Christine will be our last speaker and I did just wanna flag for folks that we sent over that letter to the HHS secretary via email when it went out. So folks should have that um, and if you don't, we'll be in touch. Great. Christine, thank I'll you. hand it over to you. Thank you. And thank you, Senator Shaheen, for gathering us today to speak about such an important issue. And from the state's perspective, that we're talking about $1.2 million. $1.2 million out of a $13 billion budget would have filled this hole, which is a very small percentage in terms of the state budget. And to your question, Senator, about what the audit would do to these healthcare providers who have been on the front lines during COVID, their staff have been busy testing and treating people with COVID. This audit will just create another administrative burden for these healthcare organizations to deal with. And not only does it require them to drop everything and to respond to the audit, but it also, if the state finds something that looks, un, you know, fishy or um, they want more information, the statute allows for the state to shut down these healthcare organizations. And the community health centers that participate in the family planning program, they don't just only offer family planning services. They offer substance use disorder treatment. They offer behavioral health services. They offer primary care. And the state statute will now allow the state to shut them down which is very concerning from an access to care um, perspective. And it's, it, it's just concerning on all levels uh, what the wording of that budget does to access to care. And I think everyone else covered what I was going to speak to, so I don't have um, anything else to add, but just thank you for everything that you're doing to help us through this and to increase access to care. We really appreciate it. Well, thanks, Christine. One of the other th things that I understood about the audit is it's not even clear that the state has the capacity to do this. Is that, uh, is that others yes. understanding? Yes. So there is no additional funding in this program in, in that statute particular to pay for those audits. There's no additional mandates on insurance companies to cover those mandatory ultrasounds. There's no funding for those ultrasounds for low income women that are now going to be required to access them. It's just a flat out mandate on healthcare providers and women. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I thought when the court ruled last week on the Affordable Care Act and kept it in place that um, it was very good news for access to care for people across yes. New Hampshire and across the country. And it would allow us to, to build on that law and to continue to work to lower costs and to expand coverage for people. And to have the legislature in New Hampshire now um, limit care for women that will have not just an impact on women, but on their families in a way that they have is, um, not just disappointing, but as I said, I think it's despicable. It's, uh, it, 
it is clearly people who don't understand the ramifications of what they have done. I would say an exceptional invasion of privacy too. Absolutely. Put that yeah. out there. Um, can I ask, as we're as we're looking at the impact of these changes, are are we going to be keeping data um, on what the impact will be? Is that something the by state is going to do tests? Is Planned Parenthood going to do that, Kayla? How are we going to be able to track what the impact has been? Because I think it will be important for us to show um, the harm that comes as the result of this law. So the answer is yes. Um, we actually had a call um, earlier this morning to talk about what the financial impacts are, what the uh, financial impact to the health center, but to the patient especially. Um, and then also the, um, the uh, ability of us to be able to know what access to services have been limited. And already the health centers have to start planning for what, how are they in that first quarter of the resources that they're gonna not have, what are they gonna limit? Um, and one of the things that we talked about this morning earlier was also the workforce. And I think Christine got to this a little bit and some of them Absolutely. did in terms of they're exhausted, right? They've been through this year, almost a year and a half of just grind and support and being our healthcare heroes. And now to think that they're going to be further burdened, you know, by something that really is um, totally unnecessary. So yes, we will be keeping track of the issues of the impact um, on access and the financial burdens to the patients and to the health centers. Great, Unfortunately, great. we shouldn't have to be doing that. No, we shouldn't have to be doing that. Yes, but we will. You shouldn't have to be doing that. Um, are there other ways that we can be helpful to you all as you're um, thinking about the months ahead, which I know are gonna be the hardest until we get Title 10 back up and functioning? I guess, I, I really appreciate the fact that you've already sent a letter to Javier Becerra, you know, that you're already thinking about that in terms of ways to be able to, because I don't think the funding that has come to the state, you know, they're the body that is, is limiting this. And Christine said $1.2 million in, in a biennium budget is, um, it's, you know, it's just such a small amount of money. So it's really a statement. Um, that they're making and um, right. and that statement is, um, you know, just only has that $1.2 million. So I think the um, question for us is with all of the funding that came from the consolidated or from the rescue plan, are there ways that for, from the provider relief fund or other um, resources, um, even with the, at least narrowly for the, for the FQHCs, but we also represent Planned Parenthood and others, you know, interested in making sure that we could find those resources to offset the, um, uh, offset the loss. And that and a more sort of turnkey um, ability would be really helpful for the, really helpful for all of our health centers. Well, that's an interesting idea. One of the things that everybody should also be aware of is that the dollars that are coming to local governments, so in Nashua, in um, Cheshire County, um, all across the state, those dollars are flexible. And even though um, they're designed to be a response to the impacts of COVID, um, one of the things you've all talked about is how COVID has affected um, your abilities to operate. So there is the potential, I think, to be able to use some of those dollars if you have um, support at the local level, at the county level, to help um, make sure that people can get health care during this period. Do you think there's any flexibility in the provider relief fund um, or any of the resources that have already been appropriated? Um, there's some, I don't know. We'd have to explore that a little bit. What do you think, Peter? I, I think that there there is some flexibility. I know you know most of the provider relief fund money went out under the previous administration, which made a, a point not to provide uh, support for for family planning centers. Um, but I think it's something we'd have to look into a little bit more. Um, so I don't think that passed is necessarily precedent. Okay. 
Yeah. The other thing but, on the but provider, let us explore that a little bit. Yeah, thanks. The provider relief fund then um, it ends at the end of June, and I don't know if there's anything that can be done to give an extension to that. Um, because that that would be a limitation too. So if we could get an extension right. to that, even a month or two would be really quite helpful. So thank you for looking into that. Okay, we will certainly do that. Um, other ideas or questions that we might be able to help address? I, I do have one thing I wanna flag and I don't know if it's anything that right. you could be helpful with, but I think it's really important to note that um, while we are talking about such small amounts of money, as Christine pointed out, um, we're not, the process isn't over yet, and uh, we still have to go before the Executive Council in order to get approval. So even though we're talking about such small amounts of dollars, there are some providers who probably won't even get that small amount of money. Um, we have been defunded in the past. There are three uh, counselors currently who have already taken votes against certain um, providers, including Planned Parenthood. So. Um, I think it's just important to note that this isn't over. This is still political, uh, and it's unfortunate that we're continuing these battles, but we're not done yet. Yeah, it it really is. It's unfortunate that women's health is a political football here that's based on partisan um, leanings as opposed to the health and the science that we know is so important, the medical science that's important to ensuring that women um, can be live healthy, um, healthy lives. So thank you for pointing that out. It's a reminder that we need to make sure that people understand what the impact of this is going to be, that we try and encourage them to contact their local elected officials. And if I could Sally. also bring one thing, um, what we have found too is that family planning providers are typically the places where people within the LGBTQ community will come in because they're much more accepting, we're much more open, we're willing to discuss because part of our mandate is that education piece. And so in, um, in providing those services, I hear over and over and over again from our LGBTQ clients that they prefer to go to family planning providers because we understand more, we'll talk to them. It's not as, um, they don't feel as judged. And I'm not saying that if you're not a family planning provider, you do judge. I'm just saying that that is certainly what we have found and that I think they don't take that into consideration either that people within the LGBTQ community also have reproductive health needs. And this is the place where they feel the safest. And so when you eliminate programs like Planned Parenthood, like ourselves, like Joan Levering, um, that are the abortion providers too, that takes away a huge piece of, um, or places where people within this community can go to. Uh, and it really limits their access. And I don't think that people think of that. We also specialize in working with people with developmental disabilities because they also have sex and they also need <laughs> reproductive health services. And PCP offices are not going to go into group homes and talk to people about a safe, you know, risky sex behaviors and having safe sex and how to uh, help with family planning for our, those that population either. While we as family planning providers will do that. Um, so I think what they're doing is they're just looking at one population and not taking a look at all of the underserved populations, including our developmentally disabled populations, our LGBTQ populations and our minority populations. For sure, thank you, Dahlia. Um, I'm getting a note that I've I've got to get off in about two minutes to head to my next event. But I, I really want to thank all of you, not just for being on the call this morning, but for all of the work that you've done over the last year as we have addressed COVID and the commitment that you have to your patients, to their needs, to women across the state who, without your efforts, would not get the health care they need and to have an effort to restrict that care 
um, for women is just, as I said, so unconscionable. So whatever we can do to continue to support you, please stay in touch with us. If you have any ideas or questions, um, let Madison know, let Peter know, let us know. Um, we will try and get answers and try and provide all the support we can. So again, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you. Yeah. You too. Thank you.